the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry, celebrating 60 years of empirical research, clinical studies, and systematic reviews. For details of our 60th anniversary celebrations, visit www.acamh.org slash jcpp60. Follow us on Twitter with the handle at the JCPP and use the hashtag JCPP60. What a very nice introduction. And what an incredible um, privilege to be here and to be able to talk to such an illustrious audience. So I hope my slides will appear, yes. So I'm going to look back to look forward and I'm um, celebrating at the same time that JCPP is celebrating its 60th birthday, I'm celebrating 30 years in autism research, 30 years since I was lucky enough to start my PhD with Uta Frith. So a slightly personal timeline and I'm going to whiz through seven ways in which the concept of autism has changed and the implications for future research. So firstly, autism has changed from in, for example, the 1980s, a very narrow concept of infantile autism defined by pervasive lack of responsiveness to other people, gross deficits in language, and still being defined by its distinction from schizophrenia, having previously been called, uh, of course, infantile uh, childhood schizophrenia, by the absence of delusions. In the 80s, infantile autism was largely accompanied by intellectual disability. If you were working in uh, the area, you were testing and working with children in special schools who typically had intellectual disability and often had minimal language, and the fight was still on for specialist services. Now we have the notion of autism spectrum disorder, a much, much wider concept with a much broader range of manifestations being recognized and uh, multiple diagnoses also being allowed for the first time in DSM-5, which I'll come back to. Now, among those diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disability is a minority group, and rather than fighting for specific services, as we've heard already from Temi's talk, we may need services that actually are expert in a range of different um, diagnoses and different difficulties. What's the implication for research? Well, I think intellectual disability and developmental language disorder are hugely under-researched and underfunded, really the poor cousin to autism in many respects. And autism accompanied by intellectual disability or language disorder are hugely neglected in research. So minimally verbal children and adults are very rarely involved in studies. And yet we're probably at the point in technological advance where we can most access and include those groups because we can move beyond methods of testing and assessment that are language-based. Um, and Mark Johnson and others have done wonderful work with tablet-based eye tracking, for example, but you'll know there are all kinds of wearables that we could be using to be more imaginative in our research and involve these groups. The second way in which the concept of autism has changed, which is of course related to that widening of the concept, is that autism has gone from being a very rare disorder to being a very common disorder or condition. So in the 1980s, we had an estimate of maybe six in 10,000 children affected by autism and were still battling very much against underdiagnosis. Now we have an estimate of one in 100 individuals meeting criteria for that autism spectrum disorder diagnosis, and some people talking about maybe overdiagnosis. And there's certainly been diagnostic substitution with children and adults who previously were described as having intellectual disability now being described as primarily having autism. Is this a real increase in the incidence of autism? That would be important to know because it would suggest a strong environmental factor since genetic factors don't move that fast. But it's unlikely that there has been a real increase, at least based on probably reliable UK data through the NHS. And instead, it's almost certainly to do with that widening of the diagnostic criteria, changing awareness, improving services, and diagnostic substitution. Alongside the change from a rare to a common disorder, we've also seen an explosion in the research field and in the number of papers published. So when I started my PhD in 1988, while I was hopelessly naive to think that if I read all the papers about autism and had them all out physically in front of me on, the, on a table, I was going to bring it all together and make some huge uh, advance. That was hopelessly naive, but it wasn't hopelessly naive to have read all the papers about autism. At that point, there were less than 2,600 papers on autism, and about 180 papers were published in that year. So you really could read everything. 
Now it's a much harder task. So uh, in the last year alone, there were more than 6,000 papers with autism in the title and uh, a, a whole body of corpus of uh, more than 66,000 papers. The second uh, implication from that second change from rare to common is that research now moves from small scale studies to making large scale studies possible. And I think there's still room for small boutique studies to answer targeted questions through sophisticated experimental design, but the need for replication means that we appreciate the need for larger numbers. And that means that collaboration and consortia are going to be increasingly important, as well as the use of big data and routine data, as we've already heard about in the previous talks. Alongside that, we don't want to only have uh, global crude measures. So deep phenotyping, again, maybe using technology to collect data at scale is really exciting. But in order to merge data sets, we need to have agreed shared protocols and we need to think about how good our shared measures are. And often the psychometric validity of measures that are commonly used hasn't really been interrogated. And there's another challenge, which is that we have to learn how to reward sharing of data. And we have to think about how early career scientists can make their mark and make their name when they're one among 50 authors, rather than being the first author on a small study. Among that change from rare to common, I want to just highlight the change from thinking that autism is a hugely predominantly male condition to recognizing that women are affected too and that women are probably under-recognized uh, and under-diagnosed at present. So uh, changing from a male to female estimate, estimate ratio of five or even 10 to one at the um, Asperger end, the end of the autism spectrum with good intellectual functioning, to recognizing that in well-ascertained epidemiological studies, the, uh, the ratio is more like three to one and probably doesn't change as much across the ability range, suggesting that who we've really missed are those high-functioning or those intellectually able autistic women. The implications for research clearly that we must include female participants and traditionally some studies have explicitly excluded females because they expected to recruit too few. We must include them but if we only include those who meet current diagnostic criteria and have managed to jump all the hoops and hurdles to get a diagnosis in a system that is almost certainly male biased, how could it not be when it's been based largely on male data, data from male participants, then and we're in danger of circularity. We must study individuals who have high autistic traits who may not have had um, a diagnosis. And we need to do research urgently to identify if our diagnostic criteria and processes are gender fair. I very much doubt they are. And if they're not, how to make them so. The third change in concept is from thinking of autism as a childhood condition to recognizing that it is a lifespan condition. And it's really been quite a slow realization for many uh, people that most autistic people are adults and most autistic people, God willing, will live most of their lives as adults. So a lot of adults are still coming for late diagnosis, for first diagnosis, even in their 60s and 70s. And even though we recognize that we're not talking about infantile autism, but an autism spectrum across the lifespan, there's still very, very little awareness of autism in adult mental, mental health and physical health services, and very little awareness, I think, among old age psychiatrists. And yet we could expect, and there's some evidence of increased rates of physical ill health due to stress, isolation, uh, reduced help seeking, and so on. So much more research is needed. I'm just going to very briefly tell you about some work that's uh, um, that we recently completed with uh, Dr. Ezra Yara, who was a PhD student with myself and Pat Howlin. And uh, she looked at social cognition in young and old adults on the autism spectrum. Uh, she used a range of tasks, but this is the reading the mind and the eyes task, Simon Baron Cohen's task, where you have to choose which of the four words best matches what you think this person from their eyes is thinking or feeling or experiencing. In typically developing older adults, uh, there's a fairly well-documented decrease in performance on this task. And yet in our adults on the autism spectrum, we found no such age-related decrease. Of course, this is cross-sectionally. Um, and that meant that although the young groups, the young adult groups, showed what's been replicated many times in the literature, that the autism group were less good at reading the mind in the eyes, in the older adults, that was no longer true. So maybe some kind of uh, preservation, which is interesting to think about, or uh, protective effect in the autism group. 
The fourth change in autism concept is from thinking of autism as something quite discreet, as a distinct entity, to, as Robert has already spoken about, as in most uh, complex conditions, thinking dimensionally. So we know that behavioral traits that define autism are in fact continuously distributed in the general population. Uh, cognitively, maybe a more interesting question, but genetically, again, autism for most people is just like height, the product of hundreds of common genetic variants, each of tiny effect, and Robert's explained that beautifully already, and also already talked about polygenic scores, which I think when we have them robustly for autism will really have a major impact on the research field. But there's an important public engagement topic here. Uh, we've shown in a twin study nested within Robert's uh, twin, twin's early development study, we've shown looking at the children with autism or high autistic traits, that the same genetic influences apply to diagnosed autism and to individual variation in subclinical autistic traits. And again, that's a really important basis for that polygenic work. The fifth change in concept is from thinking of autism as one thing to thinking of it as many things. And I want to suggest this is true in two respects. In the first respect, that autism is hugely heterogeneous. And many people now talk about the autisms to reflect etiological heterogeneity, that one person's autism probably has a different origin from another person's aut autism. And so one of the reasons we haven't made more progress in understanding the genetics or neurobiology of autism may be that we've been mixing apples and oranges. And there's a lot of work going on, including from the huge um, uh, EU AIMS uh, study, to look for stratification biomarkers to try and find out and make sense of that biological heterogeneity within autism for personalized interventions for co-occurring conditions. Um, and many people are studying rare genetic causes to find the final common pathway in idiopathic, so-called idiopathic autism. That's an interesting approach and it has um, pros and cons and people who are very much in support and people who would say it may not be as promising as expected. Happy to talk about that in questions. The second way in which autism has changed from being one thing to being many, I would suggest, is as uh, Angelica Ronald and, and I have proposed, that the features of autism, even in a single individual, can be fractionated. They have different genetic origins. And when we look across individuals, we can find many individuals who only have one aspect of what currently defines autism. So although to have an autism diagnosis, you must have social and communication difficulties and rigid and repetitive traits, in the general population, we find these have different genetic origins and they, they split apart so that the most common presentation you'll find in a general population sample are individuals who have problems in just one of these key areas. And what help do these children get? What diagnosis do these children get? We don't know. At the cognitive level, I've also suggested that autism can be thought of as a composite condition. There's no single cognitive explanation for the different facets of autism, even in a single individual and that we should think of autism as arising from a combination of different psychological cognitive characteristics or difficulties or styles. This means that because some of these aspects, such as executive function difficulties, will not be specific to autism, transdiagnostic research is really important. But also that we should start to think about which parts of this pattern are actually um, difficulties or cognitive uh, challenges, and which bits actually reflect compensation or the inverse of compensation, as Mark Johnson has suggested, that executive dysfunctions are so common across all uh, neurodevelopmental dis difficulties, maybe because when you don't have good executive function, any problem you have is going to be more obvious as a challenge because you can't compensate so well, and maybe also true for dyslexia. The sixth change I want to highlight, um, and there are only seven, so I've only finished, is from thinking of autism as pure to thinking of autism as complex. So, as I mentioned, DSM-5 has allowed for the first time multiple diagnoses, which is really extraordinary. Up until 2013, at least in DSM-5, if you had autism, you weren't allowed to have anything else. You couldn't have autism and anxiety. You couldn't have autism and ADHD. And yet we know that pure autism is very rare and co-occurring conditions are absolutely the norm. And much of what makes life hard for people on the autism spectrum is not the core autism, I would say, but the associated problems. Epilepsy, intellectual disability, developmental language disorder, sleep, eating, bowel problems, discrimination, bullying and trauma, and mental health problems, particularly anxiety, also depression, and we know that tragically the rates of suicide are much elevated in autism. And research is as urgently needed to identify why there are such high rates of co-occurring problems, 
twin studies suggest that in some cases there are shared genetic predispositions, and in other cases it may be that living with autism in a neurotypical world is just very stressful, and that actually we could make mental health outcomes much better by changing the environment. We also need to know what treatments will work and for whom. And lastly, autism has changed or is changing from being thought of as a developmental disorder to the neurodiversity or neurodivergent approach, where we move from a medical model where the challenges that a person with autism faces in the world are situated in that person, that the autistic person has difficulties with X, Y, or Z, to a more social model of disability where the difficulties that emerge are due to the interaction, the challenges to live in a neurotypical world as an autistic person. And since the dimensional notion of autism and autistic traits has no qualitative cut point, then for current autistic diagnosis, the cut point is when your traits become impairing. If you have a lot of autistic traits, but you find a niche where they really work for you, you're not going to need a diagnosis. In fact, you don't warrant a diagnosis because you're not impaired. And if impairment is a function of your environment and context, then your diagnosis could come and go. Like the um, adult who comes for first diagnosis to the, to the tertiary referral center, and at 70, needs an autism diagnosis because having retired or his wife having died, the traits that up to now he lived with happily are now disabling to him because other aspects of his life no longer support and scaffold and fit his needs. So we can imagine a possible world where autism was not disabling in the absence of additional comorbid difficulties like intellectual disability, given appropriate accommodations by society. And in that case, what will autism be? What will pure autism be? Would it be a diagnosis? Would it be a personality type? Would it just be a different way of thinking? And what concept of autism will we have in 2029? So part of that change is also a change from scientist-led to more participatory and co-designed research. Traditionally, parent scientists have been incredibly influential in the area of autism. So Lorna Wing, Bernard Rimland, who really pushed forward uh, the research agenda. And then in the States, parent-led charities raised huge funds and lobbied and attracted scientists who had never thought of working in autism before and searching for a cure, which now many people on the autism spectrum find entirely unacceptable. They would say it's no more appropriate to look for a cure for autism than it was for um, psychiatrists 30, 40 years ago to think it was appropriate to cure homosexuality. They have a different way of processing the world, but not a deficient one. So it's a new era of stakeholder-led research where we must involve autistic people from the get-go in designing research. But how do we ensure that all voices are heard? How do we ensure that the full range of the spectrum, including those who have intellectual disability and those who have language disorder, how do we make sure that all voices are heard? So uh, to finish, there are lots of challenges and lots of opportunities from the big data science that we can do really well in the UK thanks to the NHS and routine health records and the National Pupil Database, to build bigger data sets going forward if we can develop agreed shared protocols and best practice tools and ethics for sharing data. We need to incentivize open data, sharing and collaboration. If we recognize the co-occurrence and overlap of difficulties that most autistic people face, we must have transdiagnostic working. And new technology should allow detailed data be, to be collected at scale. So that's all really exciting, and I think there is still so much to find out. Some of, personally, what I think are neglected topics include language impairment in autism, diagnosis in females, autism in low- and middle-income countries. We know that 80% of autism research is done in high-income countries. 80% of people on the autism spectrum live in low- and middle-income countries. Motor aspects of autism, hugely under-researched, including catatonia, we need evidence-based educational practice, which really doesn't exist, or only in tiny pockets. Adult peer-to-peer -peer support for people receiving late diagnosis. More research on aging, depression, trauma, and post-traumatic stress disorder, and the list goes on. So a, a lot to do in the future, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my enthusiasm with you. To be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health, visit www.acamh.org.